You've heard me hint several times at this connection between Hamilton's variational principle and the first law of thermodynamics. Here we're going to take a closer look at that connection by deriving Hamilton's principle directly from the first law of thermodynamics. And in doing so, we'll clearly see the assumptions that are inherent in variational principle as we've been using it. And this will enable us to look at Hamilton's principle within the broader context by seeing clearly its scope of applicability, when it does apply and when it does not apply. So you remember our previous discussion concerning conservative and non-conservative forces. This derivation will include the possibility of both types of forces. So let's start with the first law of thermodynamics. It's a very simple law, but it's extremely powerful. It simply states that energy must be conserved. It's so fundamental that we cannot prove it mathematically as a consequence of other proven physical principles. Now we do consider it a law because we have not encountered any scenarios or systems or situations where the first law of thermodynamics does not apply. So we're going to take a look at a closed system. You need to put on your thermodynamics hat and remember consideration of closed and open systems, control volumes, and so forth. So this is a closed system in which there's no matter that's moving across the system boundary. The system boundary will be C. So we have our closed system bounded by the curve C. We could in general have heat Q as well as work W that's crossing the system boundary. There are forces F of T acting on the closed system and its location is given by the vector R as a function of T. That's our dependent variable that we're looking for given the forces acting on the system. Okay, so first of all we have conservation of mass. Conservation of mass requires that the mass M of the closed system remains a constant. If there's no mass going in or going out, then the mass of the system has to remain constant. So M dot is equal to zero. DM dt, the time rate of change of mass, is equal to zero. Similarly, energy must be conserved, and that's the first law of thermodynamics. It states the following. It says that the time rate of change of the total energy of the system, so if the total energy is E, that would be DE dt, is equal to the rate of energy transfer across the system boundary, so across C. Now we can have heat, Q, and we can have work, W, that are crossing the system boundary in general, but we're going to assume that both of those are zero. Q is zero if it is adiabatic. Adiabatic means no heat transfer. It's either adiabatic because everything, including the system and its surroundings, are at the same temperature, isothermal, or because it's insulated so that no heat can get in or out of the system. Likewise, work will be assumed to be zero. That does not mean that there's no force acting on the closed system, force through a distance, that would be a work. What we mean is there's no work crossing the system boundary. So that would be in the form of an electrical current or if there is some sort of piston or a rotating shaft where work is crossing the system boundary. So in that case, if there's no work crossing the system boundary, then we just have that the time rate of change of the total energy of the system has to be zero. So then the first law of thermodynamics in that case is just E dot is equal to zero. Well, the time rate of change of energy is zero, then the total energy is just equal to a constant. So that's the first law of thermodynamics with these particular assumptions. Keep track of the assumptions as we go. We'll review them at the end, and that'll help us be clear about the applicability of Hamilton's principle. So let's think about the total energy. What are some of the contributors to the total energy? Well, we could have kinetic energy, capital T. We could have potential energy, capital V. We could have virtual work due to non-conservative forces, as we've already seen. We can also have energy in the form of internal energy, thermodynamic internal energy, inside the system. So this is due to the molecules inside the system that have kinetic energy as they randomly move around and bounce off of each other as well as potential energy because there's intermolecular bonds that hold the molecules together. So both of those energies exist, but we're going to assume that the internal energy remains a constant. So that would be the case if the system is isothermal. If it's constant temperature throughout, then the amount of internal energy is not going to change over time. Therefore, the time rate of change of the internal energy is zero. It doesn't contribute to the energy balance. So if we neglect the heat transfer, as well as the work crossing the system boundary, and if we also neglect changes in the thermodynamic internal energy, then the total energy of our closed system is simply the kinetic energy plus the potential energy minus the work due to the non-conservative forces. And that total energy, the sum of those three contributions, must be equal to a constant.
for conservation of energy to hold. Now remember L is T minus V, so we can write this as 2T minus L minus W for the non-conservative forces. Now let's take a look at the kinetic energy. Remember the kinetic energy for an n degree of freedom system is just the sum of the one half mv squared. Remember qi are the generalized coordinates and qi dot are the generalized velocities within the system. And just to illustrate the process, we're gonna consider capital N as one just to keep things a bit simpler. Now L is T minus V. Remember that T can depend on the positions, qi, as well as the velocities, qi dot, whereas the V only depends on positions. So therefore, we could write the sum of qi dot times partial L partial qi dot as qi dot times partial T partial qi dot. So in other words, L, which is T minus V, the V does not depend on qi dot, so we only have a T here from the T minus V. So given this relationship, we can write the 2T term as 2 times 1 half m qi dot squared, just 1 half times the velocity squared, but qi dot squared, we could write as partial partial qi dot of 1 half m qi dot squared. Just to see that, just take the partial derivative of qi dot squared, which is, of course is just 2 times qi dot, and there you get your 2 times qi dot, along with this one to make it squared. Well this, 1 half m qi dot squared, that of course is just the capital T, the kinetic energy of our closed system, and again, we can replace T with L when we're taking partial derivatives with respect to qi dot, since the V does not depend on the qi dot. So the total energy then is the 2T, which is now the sum of the qi dots times partial L partial qi dot, minus L minus the work due to the non-conservative forces. So remember, this total energy is a constant in order to conserve the total energy of the system. Therefore, we can differentiate with respect to t, and that will be zero. Differentiate a constant with respect to time, and of course, you just get zero. So differentiating this expression right here with respect to t will have zero. So let's solve for d dt of the Lagrangian L. So dl dt then is equal to d dt of the qi dot partial L partial qi dot, that's right here, minus d dt of w sub nc which we have right here. And now let's take a look at this term using the product rule. We have DDT of the product of two things, so let's use the product rule. So then DL DT is just equal to the sum of the QI double dots times partial L partial QI dot plus QI dot times DDT of partial L partial QI dot. Again, that's just the product rule on that one term, and then here's the minus dwnc dt term unchanged. Now remember that the Lagrangian is a function in general of the independent variable t, the dependent variables qi, the generalized coordinates, and their derivatives qi dots. So they depend on the positions and the velocities of the particles as they move throughout three-dimensional space. So this gives us an expression for dl dt, the rate of change of the Lagrangian with respect to time. So let's just keep that, set that aside for a moment. And now let's think about autonomous systems. Now, autonomous systems in the context of dynamical systems that we're thinking about has a very specific mathematical meaning. In the broader context of autonomous vehicles and robotics and so forth, that has a related but a slightly different meaning. So specifically what we mean here is that our Lagrangian does not depend explicitly on time. So here we allowed for it to depend explicitly on the independent variable time, and now we're gonna say that's not the case. There is an implicit dependence on time through the qi and qi dot, which are both implicit functions of time, but there's no explicit time that appears in the Lagrangian. So if that's the case, then we can express dl dt separate from this expression. We'll come back to that expression in a moment we can express dl dt as partial L partial qi dqi dt plus partial L partial qi dot times dqi dot dt. So you can see that's just the chain rule applied to the Lagrangian. Well, dqi dt, that's just qi dot, and dqi dot dt, that's qi double dot. So dl dt is then equal to this. So we have two expressions for dl dt.
if we subtract these, then the DLDT goes away and the QI double dot term also cancels. So we're just left with this term, this term, and this term. So we see those here. So it's the sum of the DDT of partial L partial QI dot minus partial L partial QI all times QI dot. Both of those terms have a QI dot in there and there. And then minus the DW and CDT is equal to zero. Let's take a look at this term right here and let's think more about the work done by non-conservative forces on the system. So DWNC is equal to F times DR. So that is the force times the distance gives us the work. If it's just a little infinitesimal DR, then it's just a little DW infinitesimal amount of work. And let's evaluate that DW DT. So if W is F dot DR, well, DR, that is partial R, partial QI, DQI, summed over all N, the number of degrees of freedom. Let's combine the F with partial R, partial QI, so that's right here, times the DQI, DT, that's just, which is right here. And let's call this the F dot partial R, partial QI. Let's call that capital QI, which are the generalized forces. So we've seen these generalized forces before, in our Euler-Lagrange equation, they can account for non-conservative forces acting on the system. And now you can see more clearly where that comes from. So this is the capital Q right here. So we have a generalized force, capital QI, times QI dot. So we can take this then and put it in for the DW DT term, which gives us this expression here. So we have DDT of partial L partial QI dot minus partial L partial QI minus capital QI, all times QI dot. You'll notice every term has the QI dot there and here. So we have the sum of this thing in square brackets times the QI dots, and that sum is equal to zero. So let's just think about this for a moment. These QIs, those are the generalized coordinates. We define them such that they're independent of each other. They're dependent variables that describe the state of the system, but they're independent of each other. So in other words, we have the sum of the product of the thing in square brackets times each of the QI dots, and that sum has to be zero. Because these QI dots are all independent of one another, the only way that the sum can be equal to zero is if each of the expressions in square brackets is equal to zero. So that gives us the familiar Euler-Lagrange equation for each of the de n degrees of freedom partial L partial QI minus DDT of partial L partial QI dot is equal to minus QI. So that is the Euler-Lagrange equation for both conservative and non-conservative forces because of the generalized force capital QI. As always, the L is just T minus V, that's Lagrangian, and the QI here are the generalized forces due to the presence of any non-conservative forces. So the pattern of this derivation is we started with the first law of thermodynamics, we applied it to a closed system, made some assumptions about that closed system, and then we did some mathematics in order to show that if that closed system conserves energy, then we get back our differential Euler-Lagrange equations. So now, to get to the variational form, we need to do the inverse problem. We start with first law of thermodynamics, we get the differential form of the Euler-Lagrange equations for both conservative and non-conservative forces, and now we want to do the inverse problem to get the Hamilton's variational form. So remember the inverse problem, you take your differential Euler equation, you multiply by the variation of the dependent variable or variables in this case, you integrate over the independent variables, which is time in this case, and then we do integration by parts to put it into the variational form. So let's just do that. So here are the Euler-Lagrange equations. We multiply each by the variation of its corresponding dependent variable, qi, integrate over time, and that's equal to zero. So let's take a look at this second term and integrate it by parts. I want to move this derivative off of this term and onto the variation of qi. So we integrate by parts. We get the terms evaluated at the endpoints, which is zero because q is known at the endpoints and then the DDT of partial L partial QI dot times delta QI is then equal to the negative of partial L partial QI dot, which is this, times delta QI dot. So we've moved the derivative, this one, from here 
onto the delta qi to make it a delta qi dot. I haven't done anything with this term or with this term. Now the Lagrangian for autonomous systems that don't depend explicitly on time, the variation of that Lagrangian then is partial L partial qi delta qi plus partial L partial qi dot times delta qi dot. So then these two terms you can see are the same as these two terms. We can combine these two terms into the variation of L. So we have the variation of the Lagrangian L plus the sum of the qi delta qi here. So that comes down here, and don't forget the summation. Now the sum of the qi delta qi, that's just the f dot delta r. That was an, an earlier equation that we had in chapter four. So we have the integral of the variation of L plus f dot delta r is equal to zero. So L is t minus v. The v would include the potential energy due to conservative forces whereas the f dot delta r would include the work done by non-conservative forces. We can combine those and write this in the form that we have here, which was the original form of Hamilton's principle we had at the very beginning of chapter four, which is the integral of the variation of the kinetic energy t plus f dot delta r integrating over time is equal to zero. So in this case, all of the conservative as well as non-conservative forces are included in the f dot delta r. So what we've shown is that Hamilton's variational principle for both conservative and non-conservative forces then follows directly from the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy. Now the assumptions that we've made here are that there's no energy crossing the system boundary in the form of heat or work, and that the system is isothermal, so it's constant temperature throughout. Now it might seem concerning that we had to assume that the system was adiabatic and isothermal it would seem to exclude whole classes or problems in thermodynamics and heat transfer. And on a macroscopic continuum scale, that's true. But this is all unified with Hamilton's principle at the molecular level. So for example, temperature and non-conservative forces, irreversibility of dissipative phenomenon, all of these things are actually macroscopic continuum manifestations or consequences of what's happening at the micro scale the molecular level, which is simply collisions of particles, which is purely mechanical. So in that sense, this is all unified at the molecular level. Even with these restrictions at the macroscopic level, Hamilton's principle has a wide range of applications, as we'll see throughout chapters four through nine, which is part two of the book. So the fact that there's a wide variety of physical phenomena that can be encapsulated into this single variational principle is really quite remarkable and allows for extensions of approaches and methods that are applied from one field to another by analogy.